In Acts chapter 19 verse 21 and we'll read to the end of the chapter verse 42, uh, 41. Now after these events Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Archaea and go to Jerusalem saying after I have been there I must also see Rome and having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers Timothy and Ephrathus he himself stayed in Asia for a while about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way that's of course the truth of the gospel for a man called Demetrius a silversmith had made silver shrines to Artemis and brought no little business to the craftsmen these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul is persuading and turning away a great many people, saying that the gods made with hands are no, not gods. And there is a danger not only that this trade of ours might come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So that the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Artisticulus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them had not known why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, who was a Jew, uh, who was, uh, who, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand wanted, uh, hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And, then, and when a town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesians, uh, Ephesians who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these men, things cannot be denied, you ought, not, uh, you ought to be quiet and, and do not and do, uh, quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men. Here, who have neither, who are neither sacrilegious or blasphemous to our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we, are, for we really are in danger of being charged, uh, being charged with rioting today. So there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when, they, and when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us and to help us to understand. Father God, as we 
as we heard this morning, the most significant thing for every believer is not the comforts of this life, but the eternal security and our spiritual health. I pray, Father, that you will help us this evening as we come to study this passage, that you will help us to grow spiritually, to understand more about this God that we serve. O oh, Father, that we may love Him more, that we will worship Him more, that we will be thankful to Him even more as we see how even horrible things, as we see in our passage this evening, that these things are not happening in some corner where God is not able to do something, but that it is indeed using even things like this for the glory of His name. I pray, Father, help us to see this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing happens by accident. There is nothing that is beyond God's control, but God accomplishes His sovereign purposes through every event of history. And I think this uproar in Ephesus is a great example of that. Yes, these things came to pass because of, the, of wicked men. It came to pass because their hearts were wicked. It came to pass because their purposes were wicked. There's no doubt that these men came into this building, this church building where Paul and, and the, the believers were meeting with the purpose of opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that. But what I want us to see this evening is that God overruled all of that in His own good design. And so that's our focus this evening, as our title is, A Lesson in Divine Providence. And what we must see from our passage is the sovereign God works all things together for His purpose. And I want us to see four lessons from our passage this evening, but before we get to those four lessons, I, I really want to do an introductory sermon to the sermon, if that makes any sense. I want us to look at the four fundamental truths that should sustain us if we find ourselves in times of trouble. What are the things that we as believers can stand on and know for certain, even if it seems to us that life is turned against us? The first thing I want us to remember is that God is totally sovereign. Let us not deny what the scripture so clearly teaches, and that is that God is in control. He has all power to do whatever He pleases. And He exercises that right everywhere and every single day. The Lord will have His way. Job says in Job 42, there's one to two, He answers the Lord. And it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So that's the first thing. God is totally sovereign. God is in control. The second thing, God has an eternal plan. And that eternal plan of God is unchangeable. It's an all-inclusive plan and it will be accomplished. What happens when we come to difficult circumstances? We react to the circumstances, isn't it? But God doesn't react to circumstances. Why? Because He planned them. He's never caught off God because He doesn't have to alter His plan. Why? Because God is the one who does all things. Nothing happens in time except those things that God has purposed from eternity. Remember Joseph, after all the things that happened, his brothers sold him and he came to Egypt and he landed up as second in charge of the whole country of Egypt. And then he came to his brothers eventually and, and what did he say to them? Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, he said, As for you, my brothers... You meant evil against me. There's no doubt. You intended to do evil to me. But God meant it for good. 
to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The same thing we see in Amos chapter 3 and verse 6. Amos asks two questions. He says, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? In the olden times, when a trumpet was blown, what does it mean? There's war. Somebody's coming to attack. And so everybody is afraid. And he says, so if a trumpet is blown in the city, the people are going to be afraid. And then he says, does disaster come to a city unless God has done it? So he's saying, there is no disaster even that happens in life if God has not designed it, if God is not behind it. God has an eternal plan, and all that he determined will occur. Nothing can stop it. Everything that happens fulfills God's eternal plan. Thirdly, God rules all things. It's easy in our day sometimes to think that God is simply a, a spectator sitting in heaven, in heaven hoping that things will turn out for the good. But the fact is that's not the case because all things work His purpose and He is doing it. Everything that happens is God because God is everywhere. Who's the one who sustains everything? Who's the one who rules everything? And who is it that brings everything to the end? It is God, because God is truly in control. The sparrow cannot even go and sit on a branch. The sparrow cannot take flight to go anywhere. The sparrow cannot find anything to eat. Unless God works to accomplish that. And if God could look after the sparrows, how much more will He look after His own children? How much more is He not in control of everything that happens in our life? The providence of God rules over this physical world, over the animal world, over the nations of this world, and over every single man. In fact, even Satan and his demons are under the control of God. That's the story we see in hope in, in, in the book of Job, isn't it? Job knows that God is sovereign. Job knows that God is in control. And that's his only hope in the midst of all these crises. That he knows that God who loves him is in control. It's the fourth thing. God does everything for his glory and for his good. There's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as faith. There's no such thing as even the will of man. Everything is directed by God and will end up exactly as God has planned it. And the wonderful thing about that is, think about this. We look at creation and we are so disturbed by the things that we see. We see the brokenness of creation. You see the brokenness of people around us. But here's the thing. Ultimately, all of creation will stand before the throne of God and worship Him. Isn't it? It will all be to the glory of God. Revelation chapter 5 and verse nine, uh, 13. And I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that was in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And so all things are for the glory of God. All things that happen in life is for the glory of God, but all things that happen is also, and this is important for us to remember, all things that happen is also ultimately for the good of the believer. It is all intended to help us to end up in glory with Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 and 30. 
For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn amongst many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. We can know for certain that there is nothing that can prevent the true believer from ending up in glory. Because that is God's determined plan. Now all of that, as I said, is my pre-sermon. And when we come to our passage this evening, all of this helps us to understand our passage. Let me ask you the question, who is in control of what happens in this church at this moment? God is. And who is working all things that happens in this church at this moment for the purpose of His will? God is. And He did it all for the good of His elect and for the glory of His name. Now with that in mind, now let's come to our passage. And the first thing I want us to see from that from the passage is that all who are born of God are led by the Spirit of God. Verse 21 and 22. You remember that old man Simeon who arrived at the temple in Jerusalem on what would seem to us an accidental, accidentally the right day when Jesus Christ was brought by his parents to be blessed. Who led him there? The Holy Spirit. We know that from Luke chapter 2 and verse 27. The Holy Spirit led him to be at the church on that day so that he could prophesy that this is the Christ and that he could see him with his own eyes. And that is the very same Holy Spirit that led Paul to come and to preach in this church on this particular day. And it is the very same Spirit that still leads people today. And how does God's Spirit lead people today in our world, in our 21st century? He leads us through His Word. The same Spirit that led Simeon to go to the temple. It's the same Spirit that, that led Paul and gave Paul the message to preach, which is still the same Holy Spirit that enables us to understand and to read the Word of God. The steps of God's people are ordered by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Let me turn that around. All who are the sons of God are led by the, by the Spirit. And so we find here in those two verses, the Timothy and Erastus, they were sent to minister. Who sent them to minister? The Apostle Paul. They were instructed by the Apostles. And they were led by the Holy Spirit. Is that not exactly what happens in our day as well? We are taught by the Apostles and Prophets. And led by the Holy Spirit in order to serve God. Those who are called, those who are truly God's servants are those who are led by the Holy Spirit and preach nothing but the 66 books of the Bible. Those are the ones who ministered in this world in our day. So that's just our first point. But secondly, I want us to see that the gospel always causes a reaction. The gospel always causes a reaction. And we see that in verse 23 to 28. Now, I want us to understand something very importantly. There is nobody in this world, nobody in this world that is indifferent to the message of the gospel. And there is no one in this world who is indifferent in their approach to the men of God, the messengers of God. Either men, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will bow to the claims of Scripture, or they will rise up 
in opposition to the ambassadors of Christ. Those are the two options. Nobody is indifferent. You are either against Christ and his followers or you are for them. Nobody is ever neutral when it comes to Christ. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But I, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So there it shows us there are two different ways. Either the one who endures and listens to the word of God and obeys it. He will endure to the end. Or the others are the ones who hate us. I can attest to that. I've never been hated so much by the people of this world since I've filled this pulpit, since I've become a pastor. Never. It's been one of the most difficult things for me personally to experience so many people from my life who have turned against me simply because I'm a pastor. Acts chapter, uh, in our passage, Acts chapter 19, verse 23 about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. There was a disturbance in that church because of the way. Now, of course, we know that when it speaks about the way, it's referring to the, the message of the gospel. The way of Christ. Why? Because the way of Christ is so completely opposite to the way of this world. It is the opposite of the way of men. All of the religions of this world has one thing in, in common, and that is that salvation is somehow produced by the works of men. It is only Christianity, it is only the gospel that says that all of it is the grace of God. We have nothing to offer. We come with empty hands. And, and some make religious a business in our day as well. I'm pretty sure you are aware of that. Like in our passage in verse 24 and 25, they are selling crosses in our day. They are selling images. They are selling religious stuff. But just like the idols of old, these things are helpless They are things of contempt. They are not to the glory of God. These things are not to the glory of God. They bring no praise to Him. If you need to stick a fish on the back of your car in order to tell people you're a Christian, I have a question about your Christian life. I'm not saying that it's wrong to put a stick on the back of your car. Car. But if that is the only way in which people in this world can see that you're a Christian, there's something wrong, isn't it? Thirdly, the third thing I want us to see from this passage, trials and persecutions are good for us. Trials and persecutions are good for Christians. Verse 29 to 35, uh, 34. I want us to understand that God even uses wicked men, the wrath of wicked men for the good of his elect. Psalm 76 verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. God uses even the wrath of men for the glory of his name and for our good. And so we find our passage here, of course, there's an uproar, there's persecution. But let's look beyond all of that. Let's look beyond all of the, 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 the things that's happening there. And what do we see? What I want us to see is through all of this, God is refining His church. He is separating the, the chaff from the weeds. Because what do we see? We see here in this church, in the midst of all this happening, Gaius and Aristiculus, they stood firm. And at the same time, Alexander the coppersmith, that's who he is, Alexander the coppersmith, he withered away in the fire. It's interesting because we hear about Alexander the coppersmith again in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 to 15. And Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith, 
did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be aware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. But there's something else which I want us to see, because Paul doesn't just speak about him in 2 Timothy. He speaks about him before that in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19 to 20. And what does he say? He said, Alexander made shipwreck of his faith. What do you see? There's a persecution in this church. And the righteous stands, while those who proclaim to be Christians but are not, they make shipwreck of their faith. They fall away. Even persecution and trials is used by God for the good of His elect. He is, he is cleansing us from those who pretend to be the true children of God and who are not. Those will wither away. But the true believer, he must stand to the end, doesn't he? He must. Because Christ has paid the price. He has eternal life. He cannot fall away. The true believer will end up in glory. So the church is refined. Sometimes through normal means of teaching of the scripture. But sometimes the church is refined through persecution and struggles. And I think we, as a church, can testify even to that in our own midst, how God has purified this church through the suffering that we have had in, in, in a few years ago. God knows how to refine His church. Fourthly, and finally, the Lord delivers His people from trouble. And that we see from verse 20, uh, 35 to 41. One us to see there in verse 31, it's not as clear perhaps to you as it is if you know, but in verse 31, Paul speaks about a certain man. He speaks about the, Ar uh, the, Arche uh, the Asi Asiarchs, but he also speaks about a certain man by the name of Alexander there. The Lord uses, what He uses here is a priest from the temple of Diana. But not only this priest from the temple of Diana, He also uses another man who is a town clerk. So He's not a religious man. He's just there because of this uproar, because He heard about this uproar and He came there to try and find out what's happening. But the God uses Him. And God uses him to protect his own people against this angry mob that wants to kill them. I like the way in which Matthew Paul speaks about this. He says, thus God, one way or another, sometimes through friends, sometimes through foes, keeps his church and his people from being ruined. And his hand is not shortened now. The same God who protected this church from this angry mob on that day is still the same God that we are serving today. He will protect His church. The gates of hell will not prevail. We can trust God to protect the church, to protect the truth of His gospel. I pray that God will give us the grace to understand these things when we find ourselves in days of trouble and yes, we might look at the situation in South Africa. We might look, I, I, I just recently, I, was, I think I spoke to Andre this morning about um, one of the schools where I minister. And there's a lot of opposition from some of the teachers there to the message of the gospel. And we can look at all of this and say, we are in danger of losing the opportunity to serve, the opportunity to minister the gospel. But let's not forget who is in control here. Let's not forget who is in control. Help us, Father, to understand this grace. That you will build your church. That you will keep your church. That you do all things for the glory of your children. May we trust in His wisdom. May we trust His promises. 
May we believe that He truly loves us and know that He will be gracious to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And with that, we must know that the believer has nothing to fear in this life. What can they take from it? What can they take from us? They can take our lives and they can take no, no more. There's nothing more they can take. And if they take my life, where do I go? To glory, to be with Him. How's that a loss to the believer? We have nothing to fear because God is truly in control. Instead of fearing, let us trust Him. And instead of anguish, let us pray. And let us praise Him. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Eh? For this is the will of God in Christ for you. That's what God wants from us. In all circumstances, without ceasing, always rejoice and give thanks. Because God is truly in control and we can trust Him. If you cannot trust God, who can you trust? He is the most trustworthy being there is. So let us, instead of fear, instead of being afraid of what's going to happen after the 29th of May, let us trust the Lord and know who is truly in control, not only of our lives, but of South Africa and this world. He is in control. And therefore we have nothing to fear. Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, thank you that, that you are who you are. And we thank you that you rush to help us, even in our most weakest moments we thank you that even if we are weak you are still strong you have not changed you are not going to give up control because we do not trust in your control but father help us to trust you so that we can grow in our relationship with you that we can grow in our love for you and so that we can find comfort in all circumstances and not live as the people of this world lives, always in fear of what will happen next. As we come to look at this passage, we see, Father, how all things could have turned out so bad. And yet we see how you turn it all for the glory of your name and for the good of your children. Help us to see that not only in our passage, but to see that also in the circumstances of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.